Live and welcome everybody. Good afternoon to the Today's Dietitian Learning Library webinar, Healthy Lifestyle Behaviors, Including Good Nutrition for Heart Health. I'm Leslie Sine, Director of Professional Development at Great Valley Publishing, publishers of Today's Dietitian, and I'm your host today. Before we start the webinar, we have two points of housekeeping. First, in order to claim your credit, as you know, you have to stay with us through the entire hour-long presentation. And second, at the end of the session, Penny will be taking questions. If you have a question, type it in the Q&A feature, the Q&A box on the lower menu of Zoom. We switched now to Zoom webinars. So um, some of you might have gotten a preview of the back end when Penny and I were chatting just a minute ago, but use that Q&A box to ask your questions and we'll address as many as time allows. Today's webinar is brought to you with support from Fresh Avocados Love One Today. A science-based research, love of love, excuse me, science-based resource, Love One Today provides turnkey solutions that make it easy for health professionals to stay on top of the latest fresh avocado research, access downloadable nutrition toolkits, recipes for all meal occasions, client materials, including bilingual resources, free accredited CPE, CPE opportunities, and so much more. Access your free resources at loveonetoday.com. Our presenter today has the following relevant disclosures. She's received grant funding from American Pecan Council, American Pistachio Growers, House Avocado Board, McCormick Spice Institute, and the NIH. She's a member of the Advisory Boards for Human, Seafood Nutrition Partnership, and Healy. She certifies that no conflict of interest exists for this program. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Penny Chris Etherton. Dr. Chris Etherton is the Pew, Evan Pugh University Professor of Nutritional Sciences in the Department of Nutritional Sciences at Penn State. Her clinical nutrition research focuses on understanding the effect of diet on CVD risk factors. Dr. Chris Etherton has served on committees that have issued dietary guidelines at the second adult and the second adult treatment panel of the National Cholesterol Education Program. She's also co-authored numerous American Heart Association scientific statements and advisories that have made lifestyle recommendations for the prevention and treatment of CVD. She also co-authored the National Lipid Association's Recommendations for Patient-Centered Management of Dyslipidemia, and she served on the American College of Cardiology's Expert Consensus Decision Panel. Dr. Chris Etherton also served on the writing group for the 2021 AHA Dietary Recommendations Committee. Dr. Chris Etherton has published over 420 papers and has received numerous awards for her scientific contributions. And so with that, I'm honored and pleased to welcome our friend, Dr. Penny Chris Etherton. Thank you so much, Leslie. It's great to be here to talk about healthy lifestyle behaviors, including good nutrition for heart health. So the learning objectives for today's presentation are first to discuss the benefits of healthy lifestyle behaviors uh, and talk about dietary recommendations that may help decrease clients' cardiovascular disease risk, and then educate clients about the dynamic interplay of healthy lifestyle behaviors and their impact on cardiovascular risk factors. And then we we'll talk a little bit about behavior modification counseling for patients at risk for cardiovascular disease. So this is an outline of what we're gonna to cover today. I'd like to review cardiovascular disease statistics. We'll do that briefly. Talk about some of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And then look at the American Heart Association's new program, Life's Essential Eight. It's a checklist for good heart health. Then I wanna spend some time talking about the dynamic interactive relationship uh, between different healthy lifestyle behaviors and cardiovascular disease risk. Talk a little bit about counseling for behavior change using the 5A model, and then we'll sum it up. So the statistics, what are they? Well, I think many of you know about a yearly report that AHA publishes, Heart Disease and Stroke Statistics. This is a very comprehensive approach um, to the current situation. Uh, here's the 2022 update, and you can see that it's almost 500 pages. So it's quite lengthy, um, and it includes some really good information about nutrition and other lifestyle factors, too. So I encourage you to check it out. What we know is that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, basically among all population groups. And what you can see here on this slide is uh, the percent um, deaths attributable to different causes. Um, and uh, 
basically whites and blacks, but a lot of other population groups have exactly the same statistics. And what you can see here is that cardiovascular disease accounts for 30 to a little bit more than 30% of all deaths in the United States. Interestingly, you know, if we look at what's happened from 1900 to 2020 in terms of cardiovascular deaths, what we see is that there was a slow, steady increase until about, oh, 1970 or so, when we realized we've got to do something about this. So intensive efforts were implemented. And what we did achieve was a marked decrease until about 2010. And now all of a sudden, there has been an uptick in deaths attributable to cardiovascular disease. If we look at this a little bit more closely, what we see is that this is uh, quite prevalent in males and females as well. The curve isn't quite as bad in females as it is in males, but boy, starting in 2010, there certainly has been this uptick that, that is a cause for concern. Why is that? Well, lots of reasons why, but just in terms of the economic cost of cardiovascular disease, it is staggering. And what you can see here is that between 2017 and 2018, it cost the US $378 billion. And then you can see the, the cost for different population groups, but my goodness, $378 billion. And there's so much that we can do to prevent cardiovascular disease so that we can spend all these dollars on other causes. Okay, what's happening worldwide? Well, what we see here is um, statistics from 2000, statistics in 2000 and 2019 for non-communicable in the blue circles and communicable diseases. So uh, in terms of non-communicable diseases, what we see here worldwide is there has been an increase from the year 2000 to 2019. And you can see big increases in excuse me, heart disease, stroke, um, pulmonary diseases, um, lung cancers, Alzheimer's disease, uh, diabetes, and kidney diseases. Whereas we really have made a lot of progress in decreasing communicable diseases. But this, this really is a big concern for everybody, uh, especially you know, the non-communicable um, disease increase in about a 10 year period of time worldwide. So let's just talk about what we can do to decrease risk for cardiovascular disease and prevent it. So I really like this, this slide, this pyramid. Um, it comes from a publication back in 20, two, 2008. And I think it's a whole new way of looking at heart disease. And so the pyramid here is shows factors relating to cardiovascular disease. And what we see is lifestyle factors, including poor diet habits, physical inactivity, and smoking are the foundation of cardiovascular disease, causing uh, metabolic dysfunctions and major risk factors, which then lead to different cardiovascular diseases and death. But I think what's so enlightening here is that you know, it's the lifestyle factors now that are the focus of our, of our efforts and actions. Um, in the past, we paid so much attention to the major risk factors like dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. And that's not to diminish the importance of these, but why not prevent these from happening with healthy lifestyle practices? In terms of good nutrition, we know that it's a key foundation to cardiovascular disease prevention. And these are data that come from American Heart Association showing um, healthy diet scores for uh, the population between the ages of 20 and greater than 50. And with this particular metric, you can see that over 80% of the younger population 75% or so of the older population have poor diet quality. And then you can see not many have intermediate, hardly any. Look at these statistics here. 0.1 to 0.3% of these population groups have 
ideal diet quality. So given that, a healthy diet is a foundation for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. We really have a lot of work to do here. So let's look at a checklist now for good health, including um, good cardiovascular health. Um, AHA is known for their program, Life Simple 7, and there are four health behaviors. These include healthy diet, maintaining a healthy body weight, uh, getting regular physical activity and avoiding tobacco, and um, three health factors, including decreasing blood sugar, controlling cholesterol levels, and managing blood pressure. And that's the foundation for optimal cardiovascular health. Boy, achieving all these markedly lowers risk of cardiovascular disease. So we can see that in these data from the ERIC study, and you can see the number of ideal health behaviors on the x-axis and the number of uh, fat health factors on the y-axis. And so for, for people who have no uh, ideal health factors or health behaviors, they have about a tenfold increased risk of cardiovascular health, uh, cardiovascular disease, compared to people who have an ideal heart health profile. And that is all ideal health behaviors and all health ideal health factors. But I think what's important to point out here is just, I mean, that's a huge difference, isn't it? And But we know that a lot of people don't have um, all ideal health behaviors and health factors. But if we just look at these ideal health behaviors, again, eat right, lose weight, physical activity, avoid tobacco, we can see that just adopting one um, has benefits on cardiovascular health. So this is what I think we need to, to really keep in mind as we work with our patients who really do need a lot of help across the board. Okay, so now uh, there's a new program at AHA. It's Life's Essential Eight, and AHA has added sleep as a component of heart health. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this uh, as I go along. So um, now Life's Essential Eight replaces, um, you know, the, the uh, healthy seven criteria, and it's a way of improving and maintaining cardiovascular health. So what's new here? Well, they've added sleep as, you know, a component health behavior. They've also created a new guide to assess diet. You will love this. It's a new tool, um, 16 yes, no questions that ask about weekly consumption of certain foods. Very easy to use. And it assesses adherence to the DASH diet or a Mediterranean eating pattern. It now accounts for um, use of inhaled nicotine delivery systems which include e-cigarettes or vaping devices, in addition to tobacco. And it adjusts cholesterol and blood sugar measures. So now the key metric is not LDL cholesterol, but it's non-HDL cholesterol, all the bad cholesterol. And for blood sugar, it's not blood glucose anymore. It's hemoglobin A1C, which gives uh, an assessment of long-term blood glucose control. And then it scores each component. There's a special program that you can use. This is a great tool for assessing your patients, your own family members' heart health. And so this it's an assessment instrument that I'm going to show you about, show you how to use and what it's all about. So it encourages you to form healthy habits to move toward ideal heart health. And also, you know, it, this diet that's recommended, this lifestyle that's recommended, will also benefit risk for a lot of other chronic diseases. So um, you go online and um, just kind of go through the program, um, set up a profile, um, ask, answer questions about health behaviors and health factors, overall well-being, and uh, it will tell you what your heart health score is. So I just made up a patient and um, did this. And what happens is you'll get a score out of 100. And for this fictitious patient, it turned out to be 83.8. And um, 
things that this patient needed to improve were eating better, stopping smoking, managing blood pressure, sleep as well. Um, this was patient was on the cusp, I think, for seven hours of sleep. And I think that's why you see sleep in the improved category as well as the celebrate category. But the categories that this patient did real well were physical activity, uh, having a healthy body weight, and normal blood sugar levels. Levels. Okay, so here are some of the questions. So in terms of diet, how many servings of vegetables do you consume each week? How many servings of red meat, hamburgers, and processed food, uh, meats do you consume? And how many servings of butter or cream do you consume in one week? For physical activity, how many minutes of moderate or greater intensity activity per week? Sleep. On average, how many hours of sleep do you get in a 24-hour period? And nicotine exposure. What's your smoking status? So in addition to you know, this new AHA program, um, you know, AHA has recently released um, new dietary recommendations. And you can see how they're summarized here. Um, I'll go through them real quickly. They align with recommendations from um, the dietary guidelines, as you'll see. And the first is try to maintain a healthy weight, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains, choose healthy sources of proteins, mainly from plants, fish and seafood are great, low-fat, fat-free dairy products are recommended, and if meat and poultry are desired, choose lean cuts and avoid processed meats, use liquid plant oils um, rather than tropical oils and animal fats and partially hydrogenated fats, choose minimally processed foods instead of ultra-processed foods, Minimize intake of beverages and foods with added sugars. And you can see the salt recommendation with terms of alcohol, it's what everybody's recommending. Uh, don't drink if you don't, uh, but if you do drink, uh, limit intake and adhere to this guidance regardless of where food is prepared or consumed. And what we see is a beautiful graphic that appears in this paper, which shows uh, what foods to emphasize and which foods to limit. Okay, so let's talk now about the dynamic relationship between lifestyle factors. And I think that's what we have to start thinking of a little bit more comprehensively here. Um, of course, nutrition is our expertise, but then beyond that, because it was related to so many of lifestyle factors, we, we need to take those into consideration as well. Healthy eating, you've seen this in the dietary guidelines. We know that the average American diet is pretty bad. Out of an ideal score of 100, um, the healthy eating index is 59. We've seen some benefits over the years. That's good. Uh, but still, we have a long way to go. And we see that in certain population groups, like ages 2 to 5 and ages 65 plus, they have a healthier diet especially compared with 6 to 11 and 12 to 17 year olds but still everybody falls short of you know meeting an ideal diet recommendation let's take a look at at how healthy in eating index is calculated so there are adequacy components and moderation components and um, what you can see here is the number of points given for uh, foods that we want people to emphasize, fruits, um, vegetables, uh, greens and beans, whole grains, dairy, protein foods, seafood and plant fruit, foods, and fatty acids, that is more monos and polys, oversaturates. And foods that we really want people to limit are refined grains, sodium, added sugars, and saturated fats. And so that this basically shows you here that uh, if a person exceeds these recommendations for these moderation components, they get a score of zero. But I think the important point here is that, you know, we're looking at total diet quality and there are many components of it. And I think that when we're working with our patients, clients, um, you know, just making some small changes, just getting them to eat some more fruits um, and whole grains can have a benefit on their diet quality. 
compared to just um, trying really hard to, you know, focus on just one thing. Um, you know, of course, we want a lot of changes to be made, but just even some small ones can have a benefit on diet quality. And so that I, I decided to show you just a couple of examples in the literature where a small change can really boost diet quality, i.e. healthy eating index. So we did the habitual diet and avocado trial where we gave subjects, um, over a thousand subjects, in fact, um, over four different clinical centers, one avocado a day. And just that consumption of one avocado a day increased uh, diet quality at six months um, by almost 10 points, just that one change. And then you can see some others replacing American snacks with tree nuts. Wow, um, that can, again, bump up diet quality almost 10 points. And then getting people to eat cereal in the morning uh, versus no cereal or no breakfast. That's another one that can bump up healthy eating index by almost 10 points. So keep that in mind that these small changes have a big impact on diet quality. And okay, this slide basically shows uh, what we can achieve then in terms of LDL cholesterol levels um, with different interventions. And so that on the left, we can see maximum LDL decreases by uh, replacing unsaturated fats or carbohydrates for saturated fats, uh, adding some plant sterols, uh, decreasing dietary cholesterol, adding some soluble fibers. And these are relatively small changes. Weight loss can have a benefit and actually meal timing as well. So lots of things that we can do to have you know, a small benefit on LDL cholesterol. And likewise, on the right-hand side, we can see benefits on triglycerides by um, just replacing carbohydrates with N6 PUFAs, decreasing carbs, uh, adding N3 PUFAs, uh, weight loss also has a beneficial effect. So think about small changes having big benefits, diet quality, and um, health markers. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the research on diet quality. It's, it's pretty amazing to see how diet quality can affect cardiovascular disease risk. Okay, here was one study done by the Harvard investigators with a nurse's health study, nurse's health study two, and the health professionals follow-up study. And they looked at different um, measures of diet quality. And you can see them listed here. And one is the healthy eating index and there are others as well that I didn't talk about on a previous slide. But we have a lot of different ways of assessing diet quality. And you know there are common themes throughout diet. These are diets that are rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and plant foods. So interestingly, in this study, they looked at quintiles of dietary score. And you can see the first quintile in you know, the different studies compared with the fifth quintile, and there's about a 20-point difference. And with that 20-point difference, what we see here is decreased vascular disease by 17%. So with real high diet quality compared with low diet quality, we can really have an impact on cardiovascular disease risk. And just changing um, healthy eating index like a 25 percentile increment can decrease risk of cardiovascular disease by 10 to 20%, decrease risk of coronary heart disease by 15, 20%, and decrease risk of stroke by about 10%. So again, you know, these small changes in diet quality can have a big impact. And just some small changes in the diet can have a benefit on diet quality. So um, here's a, another slide that shows just small changes in diet and how they can improve cardiometabolic risk factors. In the HAT study that we did, that consumption of one large avocado per day for six months decreased LDL cholesterol by 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. Just that one change had that impact. Uh, with a walnut supplement study, 
consumption of one to two ounces per day of walnuts per day for six months decreased LDL cholesterol, 6.2 milligrams per deciliter. And in an almond supplement study, consumption of 56 grams of almonds per day uh, decreased LDL 4.27. So we're seeing a lot of benefits of small changes in diet, both on diet quality, affecting CVD risk, as well as risk factors that um, contribute to CVD risk. Okay, so now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about these dynamic interactions with healthy lifestyle behaviors that affect CVD risk. And the ones I'm going to be talking about are on this slide. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about diet, stress, sleep, physical activity as well. Okay, stress. What we do know about stress is that it does affect blood pressure. It affects risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Psychosocial stress, which is kind of hard to change in a lot of people, but just even acute stress down here can affect blood pressure. Of course, there are a lot of other factors that can affect the blood pressure, like cigarette smoking, uh, overweight obesity, physical inactivity, uh, sleep apnea as well. And we're talking about these as well. I mean, as we talk about these, uh, the interplay of healthy lifestyle factors. But we're talking about stress now, and there's been a lot of work that's been done trying to um, help people con control stress. Here's a study done with transcendental meditation. And um, it was practiced uh, twice a day for 20 minutes while sitting comfortably with uh, the eyes closed. And this was a 19 month study. And we can see here that compared just with health education, just this transcendental medication uh, markedly decreased uh, systolic blood pressure. And what we know is that stress can adversely affect, you know, the amount of food that we eat, eating behaviors. Uh, this is a meta-analysis that was done of 35 studies. And if you look at the forest plot of stress and unhealthy food consumption, it's variable. You'll see some studies that show people eat less and other studies that show that people eat more. But overall, the results showed that with more stress, more food was consumed. And that aligns with this study that was uh, published in Annals of Epidemiology, which shows that in people with class three obesity, you can see here that they reported having more stressors compared to people of normal body weight right here. The green bar is a lot less. So stress really can play a role in our diet and um, our weight. Okay, let's talk about sleep and cardiovascular disease. Okay, we know now that sleep is so very important. It's one of the health metrics now in AHA's Life's Essential Eight. And so we know that there are a lot of conditions that are linked to a lack of sleep. And you can see uh, what they are here. Heart attacks, asthma, depressions. But in terms of heart health, we do know that uh, people who don't get enough sleep um, can have increases in blood pressure, uh, increased risk of diabetes, and increased risk of obesity as well. So I, tell you, I want to talk to you about a couple of studies that have been done that are really interesting. This is a sleep extension study done in college students. There are about 53 of them. And the investigators asked people to extend sleep by one hour per night sleep duration increased by 43 minutes per night. And believe it or not, uh, systolic blood pressure decreased by seven millimeters mercury just by getting 43 minutes more of sleep per night. Um, there, this study was done for 12 months in patients who needed uh, a CPAP. And you can see that um, with the CPAP, um, uh, after six months, systolic blood pressure decreased 2.7 millimeters mercury, and quite similarly, 12 months later. And you can see all the different components of blood pressure that were decreased. So nighttime, systolic blood pressure really decreased a lot. But 24-hour uh, diastolic blood pressure, uh, nighttime diastolic blood pressure, 
and mean arterial pressure at night also decreased significantly. So people use CPAP about four hours a night and had these benefits on systolic blood pressure. Here's another study that was done that um, looked at a lot of participants from 11 different trials. Um, and they looked at sleep extension for 51 minutes and what were the effects on blood pressure. And in this study, sleep extension didn't result in significant changes in blood pressure in the group as a whole. However, in those that had prehypertension or stage one hypertension, sleep extension reduced systolic blood pressure a lot, 7.8 millimeters mercury and diastolic blood pressure, 4.2 millimeters mercury. And so actually, you know, I think this is really kind of interesting. Sleep duration has been shown to be associated with diet quality. And look here in this particular study, uh, people who don't sleep a lot, less than five hours per night, people who sleep too much, uh, but people uh, have a low HEI, whereas people who get the recommended amount of sleep you know, basically have um, a higher diet quality. And so, uh, you know, when looking at short sleepers, they didn't consume um, much fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains, dairy, protein, and seafood. And people who slept a long time had higher consumption of unhealthier foods, like refined grains, added sugar, and... Um, some, as well as some healthier components. So it's sort of mixed, but, you know, higher consumption of things that we really do want to limit. Okay, so let's look at heart health related labs and lifestyle now. What do we know? Well, getting back to triglycerides now, we can really do a lot to lower triglycerides uh, markedly, although Many patients will experience about a 10%, 20% reduction in triglycerides with weight loss, but others will experience a lot more. Dietary modifications, you know, it really depends on what the baseline triglyceride levels are, but we can really lower triglycerides a lot by restricting alcohol and cutting carbs, especially uh, simple carbs a lot. But also we can uh, decrease triglycerides with physical activity. Let me just make sure this is right. Okay. Um, exercise has the beneficial effects on lipids and lipoproteins. And so this was a univariate meta-analysis of 48 data sets on almost 3,000 participants. And basically exercise was shown to decrease cholesterol, triglycerides, increase HDL, and also decrease LDL. Interestingly, um, the intensity uh, affected triglycerides, but the amount of time affected HDL and LDLC. What about smoking? Um, you know, smoking adversely affects lipids and lipoproteins. And what we see here is that in quintiles of smokers, uh, the number of cigarettes consumed in this study of 1,500 subjects, uh, basically with increasing smoking, you can see total cholesterol increased, um, total LDL particles increased, LDL increased, and triglycerides also increased. So again, what we're seeing here is relationship of all of these different lifestyle behaviors um, on risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Okay, so obstructive sleep apnea independently predicts lipid levels. So poor sleep quality. Um, this is a measure of uh, poor sleep quality. Um, increased total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides, and HDL cholesterol levels were lower. So this was um, a large data set cross-sectional analysis of 8,592 patients that basically showed, you know, getting poor sleep quality uh, adversely affects lipids and lipoproteins. What about blood glucose levels? We know this, that, you know, there's a relationship between blood glucose, not only diet, but physical activity 
uh, body weight, weight loss, but stress and sleep deprivation. And here are some recommendations uh, about controlling blood glucose levels. But it's all sort of interconnected here, as you can see. Okay, prevention. Prevention. Okay, um, we, we have amazing nutrition expertise. I think we really need to think about nutrition and other healthy lifestyle behaviors as well, because they kind of all go hand in hand and together. So here are some examples of how they do. Low physical activity is related to high BMI, poor psychological wellness, sleep and diet. Poor sleep quality is related to high BMI, poor psychological wellness, poor diet quality, and on and on and on. High BMI, poor diet quality, psychological wellness, sleep, and poor physical activity. Uh, they all sort of are interconnected, and we really need to take this into account when we're thinking about heart health. So how do we go about doing this? This is the 2019 ACC AHA Prevention Guideline, and here are the top 10 take-home messages. Three of them are listed here. One is promote a healthy lifestyle throughout life. That's what we need to do. That's what needs to be our focus now. And then a team-based approach is important. And then we also really need to assess um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. And I think that using um, Life's Essential Eight programs can really help you assess a patient's risk of cardiovascular disease and help them figure out um, you know, which of the health metrics to focus on. And so what's recommended here, a team-based approach and also shared decision-making. We have to be concerned about social determinants of health because many of our patients need assistance with the 5A model in implementing recommendations that we make. So we'll talk a little bit more about those in just a little bit. Here's the 5A model. You know about this. First, you assess. So assess a patient's relevant lifestyle behaviors and then advise them, okay, this is what's recommended. Um, and, and, you know, what are we going to do to try and get you to meet current recommendations? So you agree in terms of shared decision-making on goals. Uh, we start with SMART goals, a specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed goals for behavior change. Again, through shared decision making, what can what does the patient think that they can do? And then here is where the rubber meets the road, and that is here's where patients really need help. They need assistance, and they need help figuring out how to go about uh, achieving the recommendations that are being made. What they say that they're going to do. Maybe it's in terms of getting adequate sleep. Maybe it's in terms of nutrition. Maybe it's in terms of regular physical activity. But um, when Christina Peterson and I wrote this paper um, that talked about this 5A model, um, you know, we, we reviewed the literature and basically saw that physicians in particular, healthcare providers are so good with the first three A's, that is assessing and advising and even you know, um, deciding what would be good for a patient to do uh, in consultation with them. And then you know, a patient is off on their own, you know, trying to figure out how to make things happen. And that's where things, the bottom falls out. And that's where they really need help. And here's where we can really, really help. Assisting and arranging to help patients uh, meet the goals that we've set for them. For, them to achieve one or more healthy lifestyle behaviors. And so, um, you know, here are some quick sleep tips. Here are things that you can use to help your patient if they decide, okay, they really need to work on sleep. Uh, what I think is interesting here is lots and lots and lots of tips. Um, but, you know, some of the tips relate to other lifestyle habits. Factors like nutrition, don't eat a large meal before bedtime, avoid consuming caffeine in the afternoon or evening, um, avoid consuming alcohol before bedtime, reduce your fluid intake 
before bedtime. And some relate to other factors as well, like physical activity. So you can see how everything is all uh, interconnected here. But here's something that I think, you know, we can do with our patients is give them tips, help them assist and arrange in meeting goals that we're setting with them. Uh, this is something we included in our paper. Questions clinicians can use to identify potential well-being or stress-related barriers to lifestyle changes. And this really helps with the assist stage of the 5A model. And so you can just ask these questions of your patients um, to just kind of figure out um, what are some, how stressed they are, you know, what stress factors are going to prevent them, hinder them from achieving uh, goals related to um, health behaviors that you all have set. And then the, the 5A model goes across the lifespan here. And that's really important um, to think across the lifespan, um, all life stages, uh, because that's our focus right now, you know, is primordial prevention. Prevent the risk factors from ever occurring in the first place. And that starts early on. So we want to do this assessment, advising, agreeing, assisting, and arranging, basically at all life stages too, to aim for ideal cardiovascular health. Okay, so in terms of blood pressure now, that's a major risk factor. Um, you know, these two tables come from uh, the prevention guidelines. And what we can see here is that there are a lot of factors, um, nutrition and physical activity factors that affect blood pressure. And what you can see here is that, um, you know, they, they can affect blood pressure um, quite markedly, like a DASH diet, or less so, but collectively, you know, you put them all together and they can really have an impact on blood pressure. But even these small changes, even in people with that don't have high blood pressure, look here, physical activity you know, can decrease blood pressure, um, two to four millimeters mercury. That, that's really significant when you think about age-related increases in blood pressure. But boy, look at diet here, weight loss, a healthy diet, reduced sodium intake, and then increased potassium intake, lots of benefits of a healthy diet, moderate alcohol consumption as well. Okay, let's talk about practical application now. How do we use all this material? Here's our patient. He's a 40-year-old man, married with three young children. He's a manager of a large department store. His wife works as well. He has a poor diet, uh, sleep apnea, sedentary and stress, he has obesity, his BMI is 30, elevated LDL, has high blood pressure and high glucose levels. That's sort of a, an average client for a lot of us. But what's really exciting is he's motivated to make lifestyle changes. <clears throat> what would you recommend for JR? Well, um, we can talk about this during the question answer period. But my point here is that we have to think about a lot of lifestyle factors here. Okay, think about poor diet, sleep about, having sleep problems. He's sedentary, he's stressed. We have to work on all these if we're gonna make you know, positive lifestyle changes. You know, I think to just focus on diet without realizing how stressed he is might not achieve the results we wanna achieve. So focus on, on all these lifestyle factors. And I think life's essential eight is a good place to start. Go through that screening tool and see where he is on the con continuum from zero to 100 for ideal cardiovascular health and start there for um, planning a long-term program to improve um, you know, cardiovascular health status in this patient. So um, I, I like to include, you know, this slide to show that behavioral counseling can really uh, change a lot. And um, this is from U.S. Uh, Public Health 
task force. Um, they did a meta-analysis of 91 trials and you know the behavioral intervention varied a lot. But you can see at 12 and 24 months, there were reductions in a lot of risk factors here. Blood pressure, total cholesterol, also LDL cholesterol and BMI. And so the interesting thing about this is that with these benefits on these health metrics, um, you know, there were benefits in cardiovascular events as well. So um, these behavioral interventions, even though, you know, there are small changes here. Look at this. Total cholesterol decreased a little bit, but that's still good. LDL decreased a little bit, but, uh, you know, there are other changes as well. These small changes can you know, have big benefits. Look at this. Look at the pooled RR. There's almost a 20% reduction in CVD risk with some of these smaller changes. And actually, BMI didn't even decrease that much here. So uh, take a look at this. So wait, 1.5 kilograms. That's not a lot. So it's really exciting to see this, that you know, these small changes can have big effects, but there are multiple changes and that's what we want to work on here. So nutrition resources. Well, be sure to check out Life's Essential 8. Lots of good resources there, especially that diet assessment tool. It's it's unbelievable. I think you'll, you'll really find it so useful in practice, so easy to use. But then USDA is my plate. They have a lot of great resources. They also have super resources, I think, for patients who need to eat on a budget. National Lipid Association, they have patient tear sheets that are really great. Um, these have been developed by NLA's Practice Management Council. Um, they have patient tear sheets. They have clinician tear sheets, too, on nutrition topics, which I think are great. And then, um, you know, American Heart has a lot of great resources too. Healthy eating tips for online grocery shopping. They have some really good resources for healthy eating on a budget as well. Lots of things out there that you can use. So what are our take-home messages now? We're winding down. Well, cardiovascular disease is still the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the US and worldwide. And what's so alarming to me is seeing these increases. You know, when is this gonna stop? And we got to do something. So we do have, you know, some new approaches now. Let's think more broadly. Diet is key, but other healthy lifestyle behaviors are central to decreasing CVD risk as well. And there's this dynamic interaction among lifestyle behaviors and CVD risk factors. They're all sort of interconnected. So let's go beyond diet and think about other risk factors as well. Lots that we need to do. So at this point, Leslie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Penny. That was awesome. A lot to cover and not a lot of time. So we appreciate that. Before we jump into Q&A, though, um, did you want to turn your camera on so folks can see you? I know you had intended to do it at the start oh. of the session, um, but you were on a roll. So I didn't want to interrupt. There, there we go. go. Okay. Oh, and that lovely artwork in the background. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, so let's jump in. So um, when you were talking earlier about the My Life, che My Life Check app from the AHA, yeah. um, a few of our attendees were thinking that for we asking for weekly consumption is hard for patients to quantify, especially yeah. when they don't know, they don't always know portion sizes, how much they've eaten, et cetera. So how would you suggest helping them fill that out in the cases where, they just can't say how much they've had that week. That, that is a good question. And I think, you know, with your nutrition skills, you can help guide them a little bit and maybe say, well, okay, do you eat fruit for veg for breakfast? Okay, about how much do you eat? Or, you know, when do you eat fruit? And about how much do you eat? So I think further probing can really help them. Now it's going to take longer than just those 16 yes, no questions. But um you know, I think with our expertise, we're able to do that to sort of guide the patient to, you know, figuring out an answer that seems to work. Okay. So then in that same, kind of in that same vein, when you were talking about the, the uh, Life's Essential 8 um, and the different um, 
things to add and things to take away, right? So the Q&A box lit up and actually a couple folks are still asking the question. Um, the Q&A box lit up when you mentioned oils. So some yeah. research says that canola and vegetable oil, oils are not good. They're in everything. Soy oil is the same, but then tropical oils, um, I guess AHA is saying not so great, but some RDs do make that recommendation. So can you clarify in any thoughts that you have on the oils uh, part of things? Yeah, so liquid oils are high in unsaturated fats. And so there's a lot of evidence, a lot of research that unsaturated fats are protective against heart disease. Um, tropical oils are very high in saturated fat. So that's why the recommendation is to use liquid vegetable oils or liquid oils um, in place of solid fats because we wanna get the saturated fat down, decrease LDL cholesterol. Okay. Um, same in that same vein, some folks also wanted to know why red meat was mixed in with processed sausage or processed meats when we know they're they're curated, I guess, in different ways or different meats. Do you have a co comment on that? That that really is a very good question, and you know, people can you can see that one of the recommendations from um, American Heart is to. Uh, choose lean cuts. So mm. lean is okay, poultry, lean meat, uh, but but processed meat in particular, um, <clears throat> you know, is real high in sodium. So yep. th that's the reason for that. But but still, there is a lot of evidence that red meat increases risk of cardiovascular disease. So mm -hmm. I tell people, don't overdo it. Right. Um, you know, just. Um, watch intake, watch portion sizes, watch intake, mix it up. You don't have to have beef, you know, seven days a week. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, variety is what's really important to have some seafood, have some poultry, have some plant-based foods as well. And some lean beef is okay. In the context of a healthy diet. Right. That's the rest of the factors. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And moderation, right? So not seven days a week, maybe two or three times a month. Absolutely. All right, perfect. All right, so um, switching gears a little bit here, Jana just typed in, um, she sees so many similarities in heart in a heart healthy lifestyle uh, and activities that pro also prevent dementia. Do you have any comments on the MIND diet? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, there's evidence coming out of the MIND diet having benefits on cognitive function in elderly people, which is great. Um, but when you think about what is the mind diet, well, it's kind of a modified dash and Mediterranean diet. And actually, uh, you know, Life's Essential 8 recommends um, a dash diet and a Mediterranean diet, along with, of course, AHA's recent diet recommendations. And really, they're kind of all the same. And so when you look at Life's Essential 8, you know, the the lifestyle recommended, including diet, will also spill over to benefiting other chronic diseases. And all the ones that we talked about, you know, diabetes, um, Alzheimer's disease, and cancer, mm -hmm. not as, as well as metabolic syndrome, we could go on and on down the list of chronic diseases. So it's really a, a similar diet across the board. Great. Okay. Sandy asked about whether or not to restrict cholesterol. Um, she's not quite sure what to tell her cardiac rehab patients. Is there any uh, AHA guidance or counsel that you can give on cholesterol restriction? Yeah, Th that's a very, very good question. So if you look at the dietary guidelines and even you know the AHA dietary recommendations, a healthy dietary pattern is inherently low in dietary cholesterol. So that's the recommendation rather than say, okay, you should uh, restrict dietary cholesterol to 200 milligrams a day. Instead, if, they, if people consume a healthy dietary pattern, according to current recommendations, it is gonna be inherently low in cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, you know, you don't have to specifically call out cholesterol. Um, but on the other hand, I know exactly what you're saying. You don't want your patients to eat two eggs a day. Right. Got 
Got it. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got time for a couple more. Another listener asked if there's any research that suggests calcium supplementation is contributing to the increase in risk for heart disease and calcium in the blood vessels. Any, I know that's very specific, and so I hope I didn't pigeonhole you there, yeah. but any comment on calcium supplementation? Well, I've heard Connie Weaver talk on this topic, and she's done some very interesting work with Asaba mini pigs. Uh, and didn't see any effect at all of calcium supplements on um, aortic calcium deposits. So um, I'd be interested in following up on this and learning a little bit more about it. I don't know if there's some recent research that, that prompted this question. Okay. So if anybody has any insight on that, bragging rights to the person who finds the answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Time for a couple more. Um, how does how does diet affect or does it affect i guess i should ask atrial fibrillation as a preventive measure that that's a good question um <laughs> afib is so complicated uh and you know some of the recent studies that are coming out are basically showing real high levels uh therapeutic doses of omega-3 fatty acids, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids may slightly increase risk mm -hmm. of AFib. Um, my take on all of this is just try to follow a very healthy diet, maintain you know, a healthy lifestyle, but AFib also uh, is guided by genetics and other factors as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so much more complicated answer there, I think, than we yeah. have time for today anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So this will be the last question then, Penny. Um, and it comes from Claire and she's a student, but I think it's going to be beneficial for everyone to kind of hear your take on it. How do you help people realize that they need a multidisciplinary approach to their, um, to their health, to their heart health specifically? For example, if someone comes to you for heart health advice, but they need to get tested for sleep apnea, how, how do you approach that to get a co real collaborative effort across the healthcare profession? Yeah, you know, I think that's a, a, such a good question. And somehow we really have to be very skilled at counseling with patients. And, you know, you just can't say, well, you need to do this. As you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you are all in the trenches and you know how to use your skills to, I think you've got to build a real good relationship first with the patient They've got to trust you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this takes more than just one or two visits. And then just very slowly and gradually with a lot of patients, once you've you know, garnered their trust, then you can take that next step and just talk about a lot of different factors. Um, so I know a pediatrician. I think you know, she does a great job in working with patients whose children have overweight and obesity. I'll do this real quickly. And mm -hmm. so what she what she says to them is she doesn't say you know your child needs to lose weight or your child's weight is um, too high according to current standards. What she says is, you know, I think we need to find a way. Let let's talk about helping your child grow into their current weight. Mm -hmm. And I thought, boy, that's so that's great a great way to phrase this. And I think if we can think of ways to phrase these other problems that patients have, you know, so that they see the light, then mm -hmm. I think that can help a lot. Great, great advice. Well, thank you so much, Penny. That was a fantastic presentation. Great Q&A. We're so glad you were here sharing your expertise, expertise on this important topic. Thank you. And thanks once again to Fresh Avocados Love One today to, uh, for their support on uh, excellent programming like you've experienced today. And Penny, if I could ask you to flip the slide to the upcoming webinar, just go one more. There we oh, go. Perfect. Sorry. Too far. Oh, there sorry. Go. Okay. Nope. Back one. Yeah. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So you, you actually gave me a great transition with your pediatric friend about pediatric obesity. Our next webinar is happening on August 24th from 2 to 3 p.m. our usual time, Eastern time. And we're going to host a uh, prescriptive treatment for pediatric obesity, nutrition, and pharmacotherapy with Dr. Elena Vidmar, who is a pediatric uh physician with her specialty being in pediatric obesity, and Dr. Michael Gorin. 
This dynamic duo will discuss the various types of prescriptive nutrition strategies and pharmacotherapies used in the treatment of children and teenagers living in larger bodies. So register today for that one at ce.todayisdietitian.com forward slash pediatric obesity. And Penny, if you can go one more slide, I will show you guys the credit claiming instructions. Perfect. And here you go. So credit claiming instructions on the screen. They're also on the last page of the presentation handout. The handouts were emailed to you this more, uh, earlier this afternoon around 1.15. They were sent out a little bit late, so we apologize for that. If you didn't receive them, check your spam or your junk folders. Once you complete the evaluation, you will be able to download the handouts again uh, and then go ahead and claim credit for attending today's webinar. And so with that, we've come to the end of the hour and then some thanks again, Penny, and thanks everybody for joining us today. And we'll see you on the 24th for the Pediatric Obesity Webinar. Take care all.